it's been very interesting because all of the trades that you would have normally banked on for an inflationary environment have not worked. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back for another weekly market recap at the end of the week, featuring my good friend who just returned from <laughs> Italy, Lance Roberts. Glad to be here. <laughs> well, Lance, uh, welcome back. Hope you had a wonderfully restful vacation. Uh, I want to thank you for going away. One, because you deserve the rest. And two, it really helped us up our game by getting uh, Michael Leibowitz on the program instead. I mean, gosh, I can't believe I haven't been interviewing that guy instead. I mean, it was really like frigging <laughs> the AC from our end. Yeah. No, he's he's a very, very smart guy. And uh, if you ever want to know anything about bonds, I mean, he used to work for Fannie Mae. So, you know, it's uh, his depth of bond knowledge is is really bar none. And that's why, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky to have him on my portfolio management team and running our portfolios. He's such a wealth of insight that's it's just incredible. Well, great guy. And for those watching, if you didn't see it uh, earlier this week, we did our monthly Ask Anything live Q&A with Wealthion's endorsed financial advisors. Uh, normally Lance is on that, but since he was in Italy, uh, we had Mike Leibowitz on, and we also had the guys from New Harbor Financial, too. If you didn't see that, it was uh, very animated, lots of great questions. I'll put up a link to it here. Uh, feel free to watch that after you watch this video. Uh, but Lance, before we jump in, because a lot did happen while you were away, um, <laughs> any particular highlights about Italy you want to share before we jump on in? Well, it, you know, it, it, I think the most interesting thing about it, you know, is when you're over there, Right. Uh, two things really jumped out at me. First of all, is that you know, we talk a lot about economics and, you know, there's a big cry for socialism of, of the younger generation here in the, in the states and, and surveys show that, you know, 30 percent of general Gen Z's, you know, favor socialism over capitalism. And, you know, hey, I get it. Right. Um, you know, but if you go to a country like Italy, what, what really jumps out to you is that there's really, really wealthy people. And there's a lot of people that are just getting by and there's not a lot of middle class. And, you know, outside of the kind of the tourist areas where there's a lot of money being spent, you know, you get off into the smaller towns and, you know, it, it, they're very nice. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's, it's, it, it's a beautiful country. The, the scenery is fantastic. But, you know, the quality of life you know, in, in terms of wealth and wealth disparity really kind of jumps out at you and, and really kind of brings home this idea that, you know, socialism may sound great on the surface, but in practice, it really doesn't provide the type of economic prosperity that we in the States have become accustomed to. And I want to, and, and that's really kind of a key point. I was having a very long conversation very difficult conversation with a business owner because I always like to talk to people when I'm when I'm in other places, and we were having a, a very broken conversation talking about business and economics and, and those type of things. And you know the the thing that comes out is you know they 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 work to live, and you know they don't live to work. And you know kind of the American attitude of capitalism is we really kind of live you know our whole life is based around work. And economic prosperity, you know, they're happy if their if their income covers and, and creates the lifestyle that they want to live in, and you know, just they want to be happy and you know, spend time with family and friends and you know do these type of things. But it's a very different attitude towards economics. But if you really want to get a good handle on the differences between capitalism and and socialism or or you know any other type of economic strata. I encourage you to go visit another country and take a look at what happens off of the main street. Um, yeah, super fascinating, Lance, because as you and maybe many viewers here remember, I was in Colombia a couple of months ago um, and uh, you know, very much the same the way there. In fact, I, I think probably even on a more extreme basis. Um, I've been to Italy, not for a couple of decades, yeah. but, you know, in, in, in Latin America, it really is. There's a there's a top elite that owns pretty much everything. And then, then pretty much everybody else owns very, very little, if anything at all. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of those company uh, countries have had or still have uh, yeah. socialist leaders. Um, so very true. It's, it's, it's a great, as you said, sort of visual education in, you know, kind of where socialism ends and, and how different that can be versus what we're used to here in the States. I, I will make a little, I will opine a moment here and just say that is a concern that I have about America, which is that um, you talk about the differences between capitalism and socialism. Mm -hmm. I think you agree with me on this. I don't, I don't really feel like we've got true 
you know, kind of pure capitalism here in, in the States these days. It's very much sort of a, a crony corporatist kind of capitalism here yeah. where an increasing amount of the spoils are going to the top percent. And of course, they're writing the regulations and the laws to give them even more advantage and whatnot. So I, I, I take your comment as a little bit of a, a, a cautionary one to say, hey, yeah. if we don't if we don't keep our eye on the ball here in the States, you know, um, we, we may be heading in that direction, even if we don't take a direct line to socialism, we still may end up with, you know, yeah. a, a privileged few and then a lot of frustrated people beneath. No, and, and look, I think that's a great point. And, and probably, you know, this, we can all have a very long conversation someday about corporatism and what's gone on or what's gone wrong. And, and really what went wrong with capitalism started in 2009, once the Federal Reserve, you know, came into to really this forefront of zero interest rates and massive monetary liquidity and fostered this, you know, this massive surge in buybacks and, and things like that, that really created this wealth transfer mechanism from the middle class to the wealthy. And, you know, in, in this corporatism structure, and that's what we see on the surface. Look, is capitalism dead? Absolutely not. Um, you're a great example of capitalism, right? You had this, this idea for starting a business called Wealthion, and you put it together and you launch the business and the business is growing. It's being very successful. You are indeed, you know, participating in capitalism and creating a, a wealth stream from that. You know, I started a, a registered investment advisory business, right? So capitalism is working for me. Capitalism isn't dead. It's just that we have just overshadowed it with this corporatism that's happening at the very top. Look, I'll tell you, it's very interesting. Um, we rented a, a villa for the family while we were in Italy, and it overlooks, the, you know, the, the the ocean. And every day that we were there, there were these massive yachts parked, you know, right off the coast of Maiora. and 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 not just one or two. We're talking 20, 30, 40 of these things. And, and we're not talking about, you know, 40 foot yachts, right? We're talking about two, 300 foot super yachts with helicopters parked on the back of them, that type of wealth, just a tremendous amount of wealth sitting in the ocean. Uh, but, you know, so, you know, you, you, we see this being created. I think there was a, a we went to Pompeii um, for one of the days we were there because I've, I've been fascinated with the history of Pompeii forever. And I'm, I'm a big historian. I love history and everything that goes on. And I couldn't resist going to Pompeii because I, I just wanted to, to see this archeological dig. And, you know, this dig has been going on for over a hundred years. They've, they've been, you know, trying to uncover Pompeii and there's still 25% of the city that's still buried even today. And, and it's a still an ongoing archeological site. And so I booked a tour with one of the archaeologists because I wanted to really dig into the history and just fascinating, you know, if, if, if you know, <laughs> you know, we talk about cost of stuff here, you know, I, I spent a whole day with this archaeologist for 150 bucks. I mean, <laughs> you know, I encourage you to do this. It's just a fantastic uh, experience. But we got to talking about, you know, societies and civilizations and, you know, she started asking me questions about the U.S. and, you know, because we have this whole big Black Lives Matter movement and we have this, you know, issue of, of uh, abortion here just recently and, and, you know, all the uprisings, you know, over the abortion issue. And we have all this, you know, conversation, this deep divide in the country between the right and the left. And she was very, from an archaeological standpoint, right, she's very interested in watching what's happening here in the United States. And, you know, she and she made this very interesting comment, uh, you know, about, you know, about racial inequality, which seems to be such a big issue here in the States. She goes, this has been going on for thousands of years, you know, and, and speaking specifically about Pompeii, you know, this was a city that was heavily supported by slavery, not slavery of Africans in general, right? There was there were some from Northern Africa that were there for sure. But, you know, the, wherever the Romans were conquering a civilization, they became the slaves. So there were Middle Easterners, there were North European slaves, you know, they were just, you know, a, a variety of races that were, were slaves in, 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 in the city. And so she's like, and she, from her point of view, and, and she's saying, you know, this is so fascinating to me because it's, it's like a new issue for you. But for us, this has been a part of history for thousands upon thousands of years. And, you know, what was great about, and here's the great part about this conversation, right? We, we, we disagreed on several things that she stated. 
And unlike here in the United States, where boy, if you say something about green energy, we talked about green energy and because they're having a terrible energy crisis in, in Europe right now. Uh, so we talked about climate change, we talked about green energy, and we could disagree on things. And she goes, yeah, I understand your point, but this is my point. We can just agree to disagree. It's okay. Nobody got upset and threw down and, you know, wanted to cancel somebody else. And, you know, we actually had these really, this really great conversation. We, we became friends, you know, by the end of the day, we, we were talking about family and all kinds of other stuff. But it was such a fascinating difference, you know, of talking to somebody that has, you know, a very open minded view of the world from a historical standpoint. And then all of a sudden you start talking about a baby country. And, and, she, and this is how she referred to the United States. She goes, y'all are just babies. Y'all been around like 200 years. <laughs> you know, we've been around for thousands of years and y'all are going through all this stuff that we've all been through. We've all seen this before. And, but it was a very fascinating perspective that she had about the whole view of America from her, from her position, you know, through history. Uh, that's very cool. Um, I'm, I'm so tempted to, to dig with you further into that here, but I know we've got a bunch of people chomping yeah, at the bit to, to get to the money stuff. Uh, real quick though, this is probably another reason why you and I gel so well, Lance, is, um, is appreciation for history. I was actually an archaeology major in college. Um, oh, was, so that's why like, you're doing videos now. Exactly. Actually, I was archaeology, I was archaeology and pre-med. So see if you can connect those dots to what I do right now. Um, but uh, very jealous that you got to go to Pompeii and, and uh, hope you got a chance to see Herculaneum right nearby when you were there too. Yep, absolutely. Um, you, you need, right. you, if, you, if you're an archaeologist, you need to go. I'll give you Daniela's number and, and you need to ring her up and go spend the day with her. She's awesome. All right. Hook me up. It should be really fun. Um, all right. So uh, I, it's going to be hard to pull myself from that conversation. We're going to do it anyways. All right. So we're going to make the world's strangest transition from ancient Palm Bay to uh, the consumer price index here in the States. Um, so big news, obviously, while you were yeah. gone, Lance, was the new CPI numbers came out. Um, 9.1% for June. Um, you know, I, I think being gentlemen, we have to say, look, you know, we, we sort of publicly stuck our neck out next yeah. out and thought that the CPI had peaked a few months back, uh, clearly had not. Um, I personally still feel that, that, um, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but, uh, I don't want to say that, that this 9.1% was the peak, but I still feel like the preponderance of odds are that CPI is going to start coming down through the rest of the year. Obviously, we'll track that on a month by month basis. But but I do want to to the people that push back on us, I want to say, OK, you were right. We were wrong. Yeah. Um, and well, we'll see and what it, happens from here. Yeah. And, and look, you know, the, the thing is, and we talked I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago or, or maybe it was around the last report that came out that was a little bit hotter. And, you know, the problem with trying to say, OK, this month was the peak, right, is that we're dealing with data that's very lagging um, in nature in terms of CPI. Energy prices run a three-month average. Housing prices are about a three-month lag. Um, and so trying, and then again, we're dealing with year-over-year -year comparisons. We're also dealing with a lot of adjustments that happen inside the number as well. So, you know, it, it's, you know, yes, absolutely right. Uh, the number was hotter than expected. Was, you know, June the peak? Very well could be. Could we see another very high number in July? Absolutely possible. Um, but more than likely, when we look at the end of this year, when we look back, we're going to go, yeah, that was, you know, we were flirting around the peak of, of inflation in May, June, July. So, yeah, to your point, absolutely, we were wrong about it being the peak, um, but we're just flirting around this potential high. You know, the thing to really watch here is monetary uh, flows, which is the M2 money supply. You know, that is dropping sharply right now. If you take a look at the three month average of, of the M2 money supply, that's telling you that inflation is, is about to become more disinflationary as we go forward. And because money supply is where inflation comes from, you know, just, it's just what it is. And it and, runs about, anywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. It is. And we're running and, and M2 money supply runs about a nine month lead over inflation. Makes perfect sense, right? Because if I give Adam money today, he's got to turn around and go spend it. Well, I may give, if I give him enough money, he's going to stick some in savings um, and so by the time he gets around to pulling that out, by the time it filters its way through the economy and shows up on, on, the, on the economic reports, it takes about nine months. Same thing with Fed policy. When the Fed hikes rates, it takes about nine months for that rate hike to show up in economic activity. So these rate hikes that the Fed have been, has been doing recently, starting in you know, March, April, May, those won't show up until the end of the year. The, in other words, what I mean by showing up is, you know, they, if you look at a chart of 
you know, the Fed funds rate, you say, well, no, it's right there. I see it, right? You know, um, but in terms of economic activity, those higher rates that impact on consumption, those type of things, it does, that takes about nine months for it to show up in the economic data. So all this is coming, right? And, and whether or not we nail the exact peak or not is, is I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the hit on that one. Um, but in, in the next couple of months, we will look back and say, yeah, that was the peak. And now we're going to be talking about lower rates of inflation. Now, the question will be is how fast inflation falls. That's really going to be the next conversation. Is Steve Hankey right in that we may see some downgrade of inflation, but still remain a high kind of level of inflation um, that's possible? Or do we see a much more per, uh, uh, you know, a much more protracted decline in inflation as the economy actually sets off into recession? You know, I think that's potentially a higher probability right now. Um, even and we're now starting to see the media come around and say, well, maybe we'll have a mild recession. You know, two months ago, it was like no recession. No recession. Yeah, exactly. Right? That's, that's how <laughs> it starts. They got to slowly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, there, look, there's a lot of outcomes. And again, you know, the most important thing about this, all this data is subject to massive revisions. And when we get into next year and we get revision or one year revisions and two years from now, when we look, nobody cares about revisions, by the way, but they'll come we'll look back and we'll see vastly different numbers in terms of employment and, and, you know, pricing and housing and all this, all that's going to have massive revisions over the next year or two. All right. Great. All right. So putting words in your mouth, change them if you want, but it seems like you and I still think that when we look back, we'll, we'll have seen that C, at least as reported by the CPI inflation peaked in spring slash early summer. And then it's just going to be a matter of how quickly do we think it's going to come down for the rest of the year. Folks will be tracking this every week going forward. So if we need to make audible changes, we will. But that's we're calling it how we see it right now. Yeah. All right. And, and just so you know, just finished point number one on my, my bullet list here. Got a lot of stuff to bring us through here today, given all that's going on this week. Um, I do want to ask you how the the hotter CPI may impact Fed policy going forward. You know, if, is the Fed going to rake uh, hike rates faster, you know, more aggressively? Is it going to push the pivot back, et cetera? Hold off on your answer for that for just a second. I want to talk about just real quickly about what the market did this week, um, which largely from my cheap seats is uh, it was dead flat in terms of the end of the week. Um, it cratered in the middle when the CPI data came out, but it clawed its way back to pretty much almost to the dollar where it opened the week here. Um, anything else notable to say about the action this week? Yeah, actually, one thing um, from a more bullish perspective, actually, is that, you know, the markets, um, you know, rallied, uh, you know, a week ago, and they peaked. And again, as you said, they kind of sold off going into the CP, CPI report, and then bottomed and turned up, and we actually formed a higher bottom. And this is the first time that we've actually formed a, a higher trading bottom in the markets in quite some time. So, you know, we've got a lower low, we've got a, we've got a, a new bottom here in the market rally. Um, also, if you're a technician, you can draw a downtrend line from the March high through these kind of rally peaks that we've continued to have since March. And there's a very nice downtrend line. And the market rallied right into that downtrend line today, didn't get through it. But this is the first real opportunity. The markets on a short-term basis, these are kind of our short-term technical indicators, stochastics and um, RSI, my, uh, Williams percent are those kind of mo kind of price movement indicators had gotten a little bit to the oversold level, then turned back up. Now there's some room to the upside for those indicators for the markets to rally a little bit more next week. And if they can if they can get a rally next week, we're going to break above that downtrend for the first time since March. And now we'll immediately challenge the 50-day moving average, which is going to be a real tough one. But there's some there's some I don't want to I don't want to get optimistic here, but, you know, there's some some indicators that are suggesting we might have put a very short term bottom in here. Um, you know, the big challenge over the next few weeks is really going to be earnings and, you know, earnings down the, the uh, earnings analysts are now all of a sudden starting to wake up. And just the last week, we've seen earnings drop by about earnings estimates drop by about 5%. So, you know, we've been talking for the last couple of months. We've been talking that, about this yeah. ad nauseum for weeks. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. Well, they finally listened. And they now finally watched the program, yeah. <laughs> so now there's this big rush to catch up and, and downgrading earnings. The question will be, can they downgrade them enough to justify for what's, for what's coming? So the thing we want to watch here over the next week or so is, A, can this 
you know, this very kind of minor bullish trend that we're seeing develop, can that continue? And most importantly, in individual stocks, when these companies report earnings, you know, if those earnings miss estimates and their outlook isn't great, but the stock still kind of holds support or even rallies, that's going to be a, a good indication that maybe we're starting to see some of these stocks kind of get priced in. You know, a lot of these stocks are down 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. So a lot of this bad news is already priced into the company. So what we're going to be looking for here is for companies that can report bad news and not get completely clobbered. Got it. And okay. So be, let, let, let me ask a, a follow up on that then. Yeah. So, so, so if we, you and I have been saying, we're pretty sure we're going to get really disappointing forecasts from companies during their, their calls here. And again, we talked about how mathematically that's got to bring down the, the still rosy analyst forecast for next year. And that should bring stock prices down. And you said we're already, we've already seen a little bit of that since last week. Um, but what I hear you saying is um, both technically things are looking, I'm not going to say uh, good, but they're looking less bad than they've looked of late. And secondly, what you're looking for now apparently is if we can hold in there technically and these companies can absorb these bad forecasts if they do indeed come out with them without taking another massive leg down immediately, you're going to take that as a positive sign that some of these guys might be paused for a recovery bounce here, correct? No, well, I want, no, I want to, let me be really clear about this. What I'm talking yeah. about is very short-term stuff here, right? So, you know, if we're talking six, nine months from now, what, do I want to be buying here heavily expecting this to be the market bottom? Absolutely not. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm thinking more of like a bounce, a relief rally, yeah. whatever. Yeah, exactly. And that's the one thing that's been very elusive is we haven't had a decent kind of 10% reflexive rally in this bear market. There's still too much bearishness. There's still too many people calling for recession. There's too many people calling for bear market. So, you know, we need to see some, we need to see some of that bullishness come back into the market so that, you know, if there's, if there is another leg down to this bear market, it can happen. Um, and, and so there's some kind of short-term technical indicators that suggest that we may get a little bit of a reflexive rally. And, but the, the one thing that'll kill it very quickly is if earnings really are bad. Um, and, and that's the, the question is, and here's the, the, the $64 million question. And, and so, sorry to interrupt, ask the question, but it's not so much that earnings are really bad. It's that earnings for revenue and profit forecasts are going to be really bad, right? Right. And the question is, is whether or not the price decline that we've had has, you know, accounted for that really bad forecast. So, you know, if, if the market's down 20%-ish or so, they're down a little bit less than that now, you know, and companies come in and report, they say, you know, here's, we, we, we're meeting earnings. And I, I still think we're gonna see a lot of misses because I don't think earnings have come down enough. Earnings estimates have come down yeah, enough. I agree with you, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah, and we'll see. So I, I think there's a real risk here. And JP Morgan was a good example. Um, I think we'll see a lot of companies miss or miss their estimates or barely come in, you know, at estimates. Um, the guidance is going to be the real key here. And if that guidance is really negative, then I think we've got, you know, further to go into this kind of this bear market decline. If earnings forward kind of these forecasts are saying, you know, hey, we're, we're, we're stable, we're not seeing any more declination, we're not seeing this type of stuff, um, and forecasts aren't great, but they're not terrible, then maybe markets start kind of pricing in a bottom. And, and again, there's, there's too many unknowns here as Dick Cheney is yeah. <laughs> the old Dick Cheney line, right? It's not what you know, it's, it's the unknown. It's the, the Rumsfeld uh, line, but yeah, you got the it. The Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld yeah, yeah. Dick Cheney was shot in the ass. Uh, Rum, <laughs> Rumsfeld. It, uh, anyway, uh, different different video, different day. Um, but, but the point here is, is I don't know how much of the E has been accounted for by the P in, in terms of the price decline. And, and that's the real question when it comes to valuations. And I look, we're just being risk averse here. Um, we're still holding a lot of cash. You know, bonds have been performing very nicely. Technically, they're looking great because they've been setting higher highs and higher lows for the last several weeks. So we're starting to see this money flow back into bonds as kind of safety trade as a result, um, you know, I think the market still has a lot of work to do. And I just want to caution everybody that just be careful. We may see some positive action here over the next couple of weeks, and then it can evaporate just like that. Because again, I don't think we've really priced in the risk of a recession. And that's going to become more evident as we get further into this year. But 
uh, you know, again, I think we could see a bit of a reflexive rally here that gets a lot of the bullish attitude back into the markets and people start saying, oh, see, we avoided a recession. You know, what I'm, what I'm looking for is people say, we avoided a recession. It's a soft landing. Jim Cramer was right. That's when you want to short the market. Um, we're not there yet. Okay. That's when the bear comes back for a second yeah. mauling, right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Or third, this, uh, probably a third in this case. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned bonds there, and I want to talk about what's going on um, with treasury yields right now, because we're seeing a wicked inversion there. Um, yeah. So I pulled the numbers right before this call here. And um, the numbers I have are that the, the one-year treasury right now is yielding 3.16% and the 30-year treasury is yielding 3.09%. So you're actually getting right now a higher return uh, and a guaranteed return to your principal in just a year, you know, in the one-year treasury versus the 30-year. Um, so, you know, obviously inversions like this are a classic sign of recession. We've talked a lot about the particulars of yield curve inversion in previous videos, so we don't need to go into the, the guts of it here right now. Um, I know that this is something that you watch closely, not necessarily the 130 spread, but you watch a number of other ones. Um, what is this all telling you right now? Well, again, you know, if you remember, we do need to kind of rehash a little bit about our yield curve conversation we had earlier this year, because that was an important conversation. We talked about this specifically, and we tracked 10 different yield curves uh, in our shop uh, in particular. And, you know, we said that when you get you know, the, the question is always like, oh, the 10-2 inverted, we're having a recession. No, that's not what it means. Um, what you're looking for is when the 10 and the 2 invert and then uninverts. Un and then that's, yeah. that's normally, but but see, that happened though. We had the 10-2 invert, but then it uninverted and there was no recession, at least yet officially. Right. Um, and so everybody was amazed, like, see, you know, there's, you know, the 10-2 the yield curve is wrong. And, and uh, we said back then, it's like, Yes, the 10-2 inverted, but a lot of the other curves hadn't yet. And, and what's important is it's not just one yield curve that matters. It's when you get a bunch of them that invert. So, you know, we're what we have these 10 yield curves that we watch, and it could be 15, it could be 20. I mean, you can make all the different maturity, you know, combinations you want. You know, so, but you know, we've kind of picked the 10 major ones that we track closely. And we're now starting to see for the first time that percentage is rising. What you need is more than 50% of those yield curves inverted to suggest that you are moving into a recession. And we're about to clip that 50% mark. So we're getting really close here. The 130 was one of those that we track. Um, the two fives, the 10 twos. I mean, we're starting to see more and more of these starting to fall into that inversion. Now, the shorter end of the yield curve is not inverted yet. Um, so if you look at like a one year, three year, those type of things, you know, we're starting to see those beginning to invert. So we're getting, you know, to that point. And, I, and, and to be fair, I haven't, I just got back from Italy. So I haven't downloaded my latest yield curve data. So I may be saying something here. It's like somebody's going to email me back and go, no, the one three inverted this week. Maybe it did. Uh, so just bear with me. I'll do the update. I don't think um, it has just having looked at the data. Okay. But, yeah. Okay. Well, perfect. Um, but that's, so we're seeing kind of the longer end maturities invert relative to the short end, but we're not seeing that short to midterm belly inversion yet. Now, when those start to occur, you're pretty much guaranteed a recession. But again, it's not the inversion that's the recession indicator. It's when you get more than 50% of the yield curves inverted and then they uninvert. That's your recession signal. That won't happen until later this year, probably. Okay, got it. Um, and for having talked to you week after week, I think like me, you think the odds of you know, the U.S. entering recession or entering further into recession, um, uh, that's going to be not painless, is pretty good. Um, and so I'm guessing these are indicators, these these inverting yield curves like we're seeing now are, are sort of data points you would expect to be seeing along this trajectory. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, you know, it's interesting. There's a lot of people coming out right now and they're saying, well, there can't be a recession when you have 400,000 people a month being employed, you know, that type of stuff. Um, yeah. Employment's strong. Employment's always strong. Um, it's, it, it's when it all falls apart is when you're actually in the recession, right? And companies start laying off workers. We're not there yet. Um, so, you know, a lot of these leading indicators that we're looking at, the six-month uh, uh, rate of change in the leading economic index is one of your best economic recession indicators on record. 
And it's telling you that we're leading into a recession and unemployment is a very much a lagging indicator. And by the time that, you know, people go, well, the unemployment rate saying we're now in a recession, it's going to be too late to matter. Um, unemployment, uh, employment will remain strong because what t- companies do two things. They're slow to hire and slow to fire. So they wait for a long time to make sure the economic recovery is real before they start hiring employees. And then once they hire good employees, they don't want to get rid of them. So they wait a long time to fire them. And and so that employment rate will jump. And when when it begins to jump and you start seeing negative employment, these type of things, it'll be too late for you to really do much about it because you'll already be in the depths of the recession. I love that you're making that point because it's literally the two bullet points away here on my list. Okay. (laughs) All right. So, but before we get there, real quickly, um, I want to talk about the dollar. Um, it has continued its crazy tear of strengthening. Um, uh, you're seeing lots and lots of, of articles, uh, lots of ink spilt right now uh, by everybody freaking out about how the strong U.S. dollar is crushing other countries, and it's you know responsible for the poor performance of a lot of other you know financial assets that are out there. Um, and a lot of worry of how much higher could this thing go, right? So it, 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 it did hit a 20-year high this week of uh, 109. Uh, that's the, the DXY. Um, it's now at parity with the euro, which you got to experience while you were over there in, in Italy. So congratulations. Yeah, I have a very interesting story about that, but go ahead. Let's hear it. No, 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 let's hear it. Okay. Uh, well, no, so, so you would think that, you know, and, and again, I don't know if it's just that Italians are lazy or, or what it is, but they didn't want dollars. And I, oh my and, God, and, we're, we're going to get so many bad, mad emails from, <laughs> from Italians now on this thing, but go ahead. Well, no, I just don't know if they're just lazy, don't want to go to the bank and make the exchange or what it is, but I'm just, a, a, no offense intended at all. It's just, <laughs> it, but they didn't want dollars. And, and I was like talking to one of the, you know, it's, it's interesting when, when you're in the, on the coastline now, you know, uh, in particular is like, you can look at where you want to go. Right. So, you know, we're, we're kind of in Maori and, and, you know, there's, there's, you know, several cities right along the coastline and you can look at, you can actually just see down the coastline and go, it's about five miles from where I am to, to that city line. Right. But because you got to go through the mountain, it's all these windy, twisty roads everywhere. So no matter where you want to go, it's 40 minutes or an hour by cab. Right. It's like, I want to go five miles. Oh yeah. It's 40 minutes. Um, so, but what was interesting is, is I was talking to the taxi driver and I was like, hey, you know, I've got dollars, you know, and the dollar's doing really strong right now. We're basically parity with the euro. I said, would you rather have dollars? And they're like, nope, I just want euros. And I'm like, you do know that, you know, the dollar's going to keep getting stronger. So if I give you dollars and you just hold on to them for right now, they'll be worth more. And it's like, nope, just give me the euro. So I just thought it was interesting because you know it's this free trade that they had going they have going on right now for dollars and they just don't want them. Yeah, interesting. Um, probably a comment about sort of human conditioning. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyways. Uh, yeah. And also to your point, yeah. You know, um, uh, we've talked a lot about sort of financial literacy. Oh, and also the point that you made too, though, which is, hey, the guys maybe just got better things in life to focus on. And I think there is <laughs> something to take from that. Maybe we yeah. end this conversation on that, that, hey, yeah, you know, uh, you want to work to live, not live to work, like you were saying, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, but, but, so- but, to, but, to your do- but to your point real quick about the strength of the dollar, again, just quick caveat, just so everybody remembers, um, when you're talking about the dollar, you're talking about the dollar relative to something else, right? The dollar just doesn't get strong. And this is one of the, the big misnomers and that I hear all the time from people. It's like, well, I don't want to be in the dollar. The dollar is going to zero. No, it's not. Um, the dollar is a, a currency relative to something else always and is always the case. The dollar can't go to zero because the dollar has to be relative to something else because people are exchanging goods and trading goods everywhere in the world. Um, that's just the way currencies work. And, and whether it's fiat currency or gold back currency doesn't matter. It's, it's always against, and you just talked about the DXY. What's the DXY? It's the dollar relative to a basket of other currencies. And, and that, again, dollar versus euro, dollar versus yen, dollar versus Deutschmark, whatever it is, it's always relative to something else. Um, the dollar is going to keep getting stronger. This was something that we said back in 2020 that, that the dollar was under a lot of pressure back in 2020. I was getting a bunch of grief from people going, 
you know, the dollar is going away and, you know, the dollar is never coming back. And I'm like, you want to be owning dollars as much as you can, because when we do all of this financial, you know, jimming of the economy, you're going to create this economic boom and that's going to draft dollars into stronger economic environments. And that, and, and again, because we have a stronger economy versus other countries and we now have a higher yield and one of the safest bonds in the world, the U.S. Treasury, money reserves are flowing into the U.S. for a, a higher yield, safety of return and safety of liquidity. So the dollar is going to keep getting stronger, particularly as the Eurozone in general gets deeper and deeper into recession relative to the U.S., Okay, and that was really where I was going to lead uh, this whole discussion, yeah. which is, you know, there's a growing debate now of of people that are on sort of team, hey, dollar's going to keep getting stronger for longer, uh, and then people who are saying, uh, hey, dollar's peaking out here, and it's going to start rolling over. Um, well, I think I, I would, look, the, the dollar will weaken eventually, right? And and I don't know when, but in order for the dollar to weaken, it's got to have a, it's got to have a reason to go somewhere else. Right. And what you're going to need is a recovery. You know, when the EU starts to recover and their economy is coming out of the recession and getting stronger and, and yields are coming up and, and euro bonds, et cetera, we'll see money start to flow back in the other direction. But that's not the case right now. Yeah. And, and is it largely as simple as that, Lance, which is, you know, we know that Europe is undergoing a lot of pain right now um, in, in large part because of uh you know, they're, they're experiencing all the same slowing economy issues we are, but then they have this massive energy crisis on top of it, right? And yeah. less energy, less economic activity. It just, they're, they're tied, right? Yeah. So um, on a relative basis, Europe is hurting more than we are, and therefore dollar strengthening against euro. Secondly, Japan, uh, you know, has been a basket case for a long time economically uh, and certainly monetarily. And, um we talked about this, I don't know, like a month ago or so in the program, that uh, they are implementing yield curve control, right, where they are trying to keep interest rates from rising. And the, the, the trade off is, is you can either sort of control, you, you can control your currency's valuation, or you can control yields, but you can't control both. And right. so since they're trying to control yields, the way that investors are sort of punishing them for intervening is by saying, okay, well, look, I'm going to, I'm going to value your currency less. And the yen has just been vastly depreciating against the dollar yeah. uh, since the beginning of this year. Um, but it's a similar case. Okay. So. But, but that's also, but that's also an important case, you know, Adam, one of the big trade off or one of the big trades, right. That's been going on really since the financial crisis has been the yen carry trade. Right. And, you know, this is, and, and this is where, you know, a lot of this liquidity that's pumped in by the Fed institutions go turn around, they buy Japanese uh, JGBs, the Japanese bonds, then they lever them up 10 to one and then pull that back into US currency on a collateralized basis and then go buy stocks with it, right? So that's how they leverage a lot of their trades. And this carry trade has been a big issue for the stock market over the last decade. And, you know, this is one of the reasons you know, I, I did a chart here just recently. I put it out on Twitter, um, but I, I went. I looked at total returns, real total returns for the S and P five hundred. So that's inflation adjusted, including dividend returns for different periods going back to nineteen twenty eight. So I went nineteen twenty eight to nineteen ninety nine, nineteen twenty eight to present, uh, nineteen seventy four to present. Uh, you know, I just kind of did these different periods and. Then I did returns from 2009 to present, 2017 to present, 2012 to present. And what you see is, is that long-term returns going back to 1928 to present, they run at about where you would expect. And, and I know this is a little bit of a deviation, but hang with me one second. All right. I'll get back, I'll get back to the end thing. Uh, <laughs> but you go back to long-term returns and they average about 8.43%. Now that's what you would expect with dividends and inflation factored into capital appreciation because capital appreciation should track economic growth over time. That's about 6%. Slap on inflation of you know 2.3% on average that subtracts from growth. Add in your 4% dividend yield on average going back to 1928, that's how you get your 8.3, right? So exactly where you would expect it to be. Since 2009, annualized returns have averaged over 12.5%. 
Now, the important thing about that is, is that this is all a function of zero interest rates, massive Fed liquidity, repeated bailouts of markets. And this goes back to that wealth inequality thing we were talking about earlier, this rise of corporatism. You can clearly see it in the annualized rate of returns in stocks post the financial crisis to current versus the long-term history. And that four percentage appreciation or, or return gap over this current period is a big function, now we get back to the end, of this carry trade that's been going on really uh, since about 2009. That's really where that yen carry trade really took off when we started this whole Federal Reserve interventions into financial markets and, and we kind of institutionalized and financial engineered markets. This is where that became a really important part of this. In fact, one of the, the whole key things that people were watching for a long time was like, hey, as long as the Japanese carry trade going on, stocks are going up. So it's, it's like, you didn't, didn't, don't worry about the Fed, just watch the carry trade. And you know, unfortunately now, as we said before, Jap Japan, that, that fly of Japan may have finally found its windshield. So we'll see how they navigate out of this, but it doesn't look good for them. Okay, so um, it, 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 I think odds are, are not great that, that either of those two main components in the DXY against the dollar, the Euro and the yen, they're, they're gonna reverse positively in yeah. the immediate future. We just don't exactly. see a lot of signs for that, right? Yeah. Which exactly. is why, which again, you know, if I've got money in Japanese yen, where am I going to put it? I'm going to transfer it to US dollars. If I'm in the Eurozone with all this crap that's going on between Russia, Ukraine, energy crisis, everything else, I'm putting money into US reserves for safety. I mean, there is no other place to go. And, and you know, this kind of goes back to the whole Bitcoin discussion and, and stuff we've had previously. You know, you may not like the U.S. dollar. It's a fiat currency. We've got 30 trillion in debt. Hey, I get it. You know, but it's that whole. You know, you know, it's the cleanest shirt and the dirty laundry. I mean, that's just you don't have any other choice than than the U.S. dollar. So don't fight it until there's a choice. Yeah, you sound a lot like Brent Johnson, and we talk a lot about his dollar yeah. milkshake theory here. You know, he has said, "God, I've gotten so much hate mail from people." who see me as the sort of defender of the dollar. And he's like, I don't like the dollar. <laughs> he yeah. just said, it's got a lot of problems. It but does. He said, it's just, it, it, it's the best of the worst. I, I hate yeah. to say it. And that's until it's not, that's where the capital is going to flee in a crisis. And, and unfortunately, I just don't see any anything on the horizon that is going to replace the dollar. It's Look, it's not going to be Bitcoin. I, I'm sorry. It's just, you know, I don't mean to upset people, but you know, Bitcoin is a fiat currency. I mean, there's nothing behind it except hopefully somebody else willing to buy it from you. So, you know, you know, this is this is going to be one of the problems is that there's not really a better alternative, at least not right now, for a currency that is a liquid enough and deep enough to handle the trillions of dollars worth of transactions that occur everywhere in the world every single day. You're, you're making this an interesting horse race on who's going to send us the most hateful comments to this. It's the Italians, <laughs> the crypto guys. But we'll I'm just, hey, look, I've been on vacation for a week. I'm just here to offend everybody. So <laughs> I'm an equal opportunity offender today. <laughs> you, ha you haven't taken the filter yet out of your uh, yeah, exactly. put it on yet. Um, all right, great. So um, I I'm going to come back to that point, actually, too, in a bit. Um, all right. So uh, I, I, I said we get to sort of does the high CPI number impact your expectation of Fed policy here, right? So inflation's yep. super hot. We're now seeing talks of not a 50 to 75 basis point hike, but now a 75 to 100 basis point hikes. The last time I saw the odds, 100 was leading the pack. Um, so, uh, you know, it seemed the, the herd seems to think that the, the Fed is going to get more aggressive here at their coming meeting. And I don't know when it is, but it's next like week or two. I mean, it's, it's soon. Um, so does this sort of push the timing of a pivot out? Does the Fed have to be more aggressive for a little bit longer here because optically inflation is getting away from it even further? Um, two things here. Uh, you know, first of all, the strong employment report and the CPI report give, and, and the fact that the market is not completely falling apart at this point, gives the Fed plenty of room to hike rates. And you know, as we said before, the Fed has to hike rates. They've got to get off this zero interest rate policy, and they need to get to two and a half or, or higher in terms of the Fed funds rate before the next recession hits, because that's really their only primary tool for fighting a recession. Um, you know, so the good news is, is that the strong unemployment report and 
the hot inflation number gives the Fed some cover to go ahead and hike rates some more. Now, there's already some headlines out that they may hike a point at the next meeting. Um, you know, maybe um, 75 basis points is probably a, a really good possibility. I would, I would be surprised if they came in at 50 basis points with any type of cautionary tale at this point, because the, the economic data is strong enough right now still um, you know, on the things that they look for, which is price stability and employ full employment. And again, the market's not falling apart just yet. Now we are seeing credit spreads starting to rise. That's a, certainly a concern. That's something they watch very closely, but those aren't at, at mega dangerous levels by any stretch of the imagination. So if this market can kind of rally into the Fed meeting next week, I think we could potentially see the Fed, you know, kind of keep that hawkish tone here, um, at least for the time being, and, and continue to hike rates. So, you know, I think it probably very likely, I think it, I think the meeting is actually next week, and uh, you know, a seventy-five basis point hike wouldn't surprise me. All right, and the current federal funds rate is um, they give it as a range. It's right now between one point five and one point seven five. Percent. Let's call it 175. That's what it is. <laughs> okay. So we'll call it 175. I, I was going to ask about that. Do you know why they give it in a range like that? Uh, it's, it's because the, the effective Fed funds rate, it, 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 you know, because of what's actually, so the Fed funds, right? When we talk about, oh, we're going to hike the Fed funds rate by, you know, X amount. Um, we used to use LIBOR for a long time, right? So LIBOR was the actual Fed funds rate. And that's right, what- Which is the, a rate set in London. Yeah, it's the London Interbank Organizational Rate. And that is what, that was the rate that anything that was tied to an adjustable rate, like a mortgage or anything like that, like a lot of these short-term fixed, you know, arms and those type of things, they were tagged to LIBOR because that LIBOR rate would approximate the Fed funds rate. So the effective Fed funds rate is, you know, kind of what happens with the interbank dealings from one day to the next, you know, but interest rates are moving all the time. It's not, they're not just fixed. So that range is why we see this effective fund, effective Fed funds rate move around a little bit over time. Okay. So if we're at 175, 1.75% right now, uh, 75 basis point hike will get us to two and a half percent. Um, we, we, I mean, I know the Fed is trying to get as much as it can get away with without breaking the market, but, but what do you kind of think the Fed sort of needs to get near to have enough cushion to fight the type of recession that's coming here? Well, it, it, you don't know, right? And, and the question is, is how bad of a recession are we talking about? And, and this is kind of the one, you know, kind of, you know, the big question of the day is, is, you know, is it a mild recession? Is it a big recession? You know, the, the problem is that all this, economic growth that we had from 2020 to present was all artificial. So we had this massive surge in earnings, you know, earnings grew by 110%. Um, we've seen this massive, you know, growth rate in the economy. And that was all based on this liquidity. It was all pumped, this 5 trillion in liquidity that was pumped into the markets. And that filtered through everything, right? It filtered through the economy, the stock market, everything else. Now that's gone. And there's no more liquidity that's coming back into the markets. So, you know, the, the, effectively what's got to happen here is that market dynamics have to return back to what would be normal X that liquidity. And, you know, that's a pretty big drop from here um, to get back to that level. So, you know, you know there's, a, there's a real possibility that this could be a much nastier recession than a lot of people are giving credit for because a lot of people are looking at that growth in 2020 and 2021 as being this organic recovery of the economy. And it was, there was absolutely nothing organic about it. So, you know, you know, again, but there's, there's so many things that are kind of in flux right now. It's hard to say just how big of an economic reversion are we going to actually see, but generally things that are exacerbated to the upside tend to get exacerbated to the downside. Right. All right. So um, I'm going to ask again, because that I'm was not a sure great, I your, great I'm not answer, sure I but a non-answer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, um, sounds like you think that, that the odds of a medium to more painful than that recession aren't bad at this point. Are, right. are, is, is, a, is a two and a half percent federal funds rate going to cut it or are we going to need something higher than that? Yeah, so that, that was the question I didn't answer. Um, I think you're going to need something more than that. I, but look, if you can get to two and a half, it's a start. Um, 
They can cut by two and a half percentage points, get that rate back to zero, start, you know, reverse QT, go back to QE, um, you know, and maybe you stall off the worst of the recession. You know, if they can get to three, that's better. Three and a half is even better. I, I don't know how they get there without blowing something up first. That's, you know, this is a really short fuse they're playing with between the economic imbalances and how much, because of all the credit usage that's in the economy, um, you know, how far you can raise those short-term rates without blowing up consumption. And I just don't, I don't know. There's, there's no way to say at 3% game over, right? There's, there's a lot of flex in that number, but there's no doubt that at some point you're going to hike rates. And also the other issue is timing, right? Because I said before, it takes nine months for these policies to get through the system. So if they hike real fast up front, it takes nine months for those to show up in the system. So everybody's going to say, look, they hiked rates a whole bunch and nothing happened. And then you get smacked by the bus and you, know, <laughs> and you turn around. And, you know, and so they could exacerbate a much deeper recession because of hiking too fast on the front end. Right. And I think a lot of people, and you and I, correct me if you disagree, but I, I think there's, a, there's some of that going on here where you and I think the inflation problem this is an oversimplification, but it's going to somewhat take care of itself here as you have organic demand destruction because prices just get too high and people can't pay it and they're going to, you know, they, they, they got to forego making purchases. And then you've got the rising cost of capital that we've talked about uh, in the slowing economy. Um, so the, the, the Fed is sort of, um, I'm trying to get the right analogy here, but it's, it's, it, 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 it may be putting, you know, the brakes on too hard. Um, when the car was going to slow anyways, right? And so where you might have slowly rolled to a gen more gentle stop, you know, now people are going to get some damage from the, the whiplash. I don't know if that's a good analogy or not. No, but, it's, it's more, yeah, but it's very much like, you know, Wiley e. Coyote on the rocket, right? I mean, it's just, you know, whenever, you know, he, he almost catches up with the roadrunner then runs over the cliff. And that's kind of where the Fed is. You know, yeah, they're, exactly. They're, jump they're jumping on this rocket. And you're definitely headed towards the cliff. And the problem is, is you're not going to catch the roadrunner before you get there. So, you know. All right. Um, that's a much better analogy, by the way. All right. So I'm going to tie but together real, something you said. Oh, go ahead. Real, real quick, real quick, though, um, because you brought up consumption. And this is uh, another one of those misnomers. And I, uh, I, got, I saw this, this today, as a, as a matter of fact. Somebody tweeted out, and I, I can't remember where I saw it now, but somebody tweeted out, well, don't worry about a recession because consumers are completely flush with cash, right? There's all this savings that are sitting there. And, you know, as we talked about before, all those savings are in the top 10% of income earners that have plenty, of, and they're sitting right, on their yachts right. right now off the coast of Italy. Uh, they're completely fine. But it's real simple analogy, look, or real simple to look at. If you know, if consumers had all these savings, you wouldn't see the massive ramp up in credit card usage that you're seeing right now. I mean, we've got credit card uses has surged over the last three, four months and is now at a new record high. If people had a bunch of cash and savings, they would spend their savings, not go run up credit cards. So it tells you that the bottom 80% of people don't have a big savings cushion sitting there and they're, they're not going to be able to weather an economic downturn of any consequence. Yeah, absolutely. I was actually just looking at a, a chart today. I'll see if I can find it um, to put up here, but it, it was overlaying the personal savings rate with uh, the increase in, in consumer debt. Yeah. And uh, it, they're just inverse charts of one another. Right, you know, yeah. and that's just a great example of saying what you exactly what, what you said. Yeah, exactly they've, what you'd expect. Yeah, yeah, they've they've run out of those savings now. Now, I, I actually put a tweet around that, which is <sighs> society being what it is, we're so like convenience addicted that um, we're not tightening the belt yet. We're just keeping the current lifestyle on. We're just financing it differently now. Right, we were pulling it out of the savings that had built up. Uh, which actually were borrowed from the future anyways, because a lot of that came from government stimulus. Uh, and now we're just borrowing from the credit card companies. And, and then the belt tightening will really start in earnest once the, the credit cards get maxed out and we have no ability to, you know, borrow from somebody else to, to keep it going. So, you know, I think that that an important part of like consumption, we, we, we haven't seen that down like yet when people just are forced to stop making discretionary purchases because they just don't have the credit to do so anymore. Exactly. All you know, right, and then again, yeah, well, you know, we just had retail sales out, um, you know, on Friday and, and everybody was like, Ooh, you know, retail sales up one or Thursday, whenever they came out, um, you know, retail sales, 1%, much stronger than expected. Again, let's go back basic it's economics. Because prices are higher. Yeah. 
Exactly. Prices are higher and people are paying more, they're buying less. But yeah, you know, this yeah. is and but that all feeds through to, you know, it's gonna be we're gonna see credit card, credit card debt go up again because that money's gotta come from somewhere. Right. And interestingly, kind of on a similar vein, um, because we've talked a lot about how demand really didn't show up in Q2 the way that that retailers expected. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about all these liquidation sales that were coming so that Amazon just had Amazon Prime Day. And there were a few products that were discounted. And there was like a TV that was discounted by like 79%. You had these ridiculous discounts that Amazon had never offered before, but it's because they had all this inventory yeah. they had stocked up for and the party didn't happen. People didn't show up to buy it. So they just got to clear it, right? Well, no, so, I'm, I'm waiting to see, you know, that Amazon Prime Day was the 12th and 13th of this month. Um, so I'm waiting to see what the results of that were in terms of, you know, how many people actually showed up for Prime Day, how many people actually bought stuff. So I think that's going to be really interesting. I'm really anxious about the Amazon report coming out. We owned Amazon for a long time. We sold it earlier this year. And I'm looking for an entry point. I still love the company. I think long term, it's a great play. You know, right now you can buy Amazon for their AWS web services and basically get the retail side for free. Right. So, you know, if 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 we can, you know, get to the point where again, so I'm really waiting and kind of anticipating their uh, their earnings report. If they come out and, and report really crappy retail sales number and the stock stabilizes, then I'm probably going to start accumulating a position there. But I'm anxious to see their report to talk about what happened on Prime Day this year as a consequence of, you know, what consumers are actually doing. Did, did everybody show up for Prime Day and spend a bunch of money? Or was it we threw open the door and had these great discounts and nobody showed up? That's right, right. that's the thing I'm, I'm anxious to see. All right, well, when that data comes in, folks, we'll, we'll cover it here on this channel. Yep. Um, you're, you're, you're marking a, a future rant uh, for this, uh, this program, Lance. Uh, can't get into it today, but... Um, is uh, how some of these big tech companies are not, you know, trusts that should be broken up. Um, and, uh, you know, just real quick mentioning, you know, it, basically Amazon, it, it's cloud server business, wildly profitable, and it, it allows Amazon to run the e-commerce business the way that it does, where it just outcompetes all small yeah. players into oblivion, right? Um, and, uh, uh Again, rant for another day. Um, but if you, if you, no, happy to do that rant because I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. And look, folks, you, even though I use a lot of Google services, I don't understand how Google search cannot be a monopoly when you've had like 96% of this, the, the search market forever. But another, another know, but, but, and just interesting. And, and again, another rant for another day. But, you know, people don't remember we broke up ATT. And then we let them put it all back together. Yeah, and then we let them put it all back together. But, but yeah, I mean, it did happen in our lifetime. We, we've yeah. seen a massive antitrust uh, effort. Yeah. It's time, um, it's time our, for another one. Yeah. Um, and we got a lot of, you know, I think there were a lot of benefits out of that. Um, but anyways, we, we can, again, dig into that later on. Um, I, I want to go back to the Fed in a way to tie it to what's happening in the jobs market, because we've talked about both briefly. Um, people always talk about the Fed looking in the rear view mirror, and there was a, a uh, Quote picked up this week by uh, Fed official uh, Waller, who um, he, he made the following quotes. He said, this is about as good a job market as any worker has ever seen. Uh, and then he said, we may have to take the risk of causing some economic damage, um, given how strong the job market is, uh, our moves are unlikely to cause a real severe recession. So what he's basically saying is, is hey, I think we can be more aggressive as the Fed because jobs are so strong, the economy can handle it. And to me, what that guy's doing is he's, he's yeah, sure, jobs have been, if you look at the job market right now, and you know, I, I don't know if it's still two openings for every applicant or whatever, but, but there's, there's still more openings probably than, than every applicant right now, at least with the overcounting that they currently do. Um, and it might be a fair statement to say like, yeah, it's still a good time if you're looking for a job, but that's a snapshot. I mean, if you're looking at the real time stats that are going on right now, that job market is cooling tremendously quickly. And, uh, you know, uh, more importantly, it's the economy that determines the job market. Just because there are a lot of jobs doesn't mean the economy is going to do well tomorrow. 
right? Exactly. Right? You need the economic growth to afford those jobs. So he's kind of looking at it ass backwards, in, in, in my opinion. Um, and you and I have talked about, and you mentioned it briefly, that the, the Q2 earnings are about to start. You know, if how, how rosy is the job market going to start looking if companies have said, hey, look, you know, we think our earnings are going to go down by 10 percent and our profits are going to go down by 30 percent for reasons X, Y or Z. You're just going to have to have layoffs in that type of future. And um, let, let me just quickly go into a couple of data points and I'll let you run on this. So looking at the job markets, which you and I have been raising uh, warning flags about. Um, is a Bloomberg article that just came out. And I'm going to read this quote from it. In the past few weeks, companies have announced tens of thousands of job cuts and plans to freeze hiring. The bulk has come from technology, cryptocurrency, and real estate firms, big and small, which have laid off at least 37 workers, sorry, 37,000 workers since May. Um, brokerages and banks, including JP Morgan Chase & Co., are reducing headcount as the housing market cools. So um, I just want to show two images here. One is for a Google search for hiring freeze. And as we talked about, companies, initially, as you said, they're, they're late to hire, late to fire. Before you fire, you do a hiring freeze, right? So these are just the top stories. Google, Meta, Tesla, all the tech companies are hitting the brakes on hiring. The Silicon Valley companies experiencing layoffs, a list. U.S. layoffs, hiring freezes are tip of labor market slowdown. Um, CNBC op-ed, hiring freezes have started and job losses are coming. Um, so, I mean, this is something that is unfolding in front of us in real time here. It's not us prognosticating about what might happen. We are seeing a real time cooling of the market here. Next uh, image I want to put up here is uh, same thing. Google search for layoffs. Uh, TechLink layoffs jolt hundreds of Bay Area workers, including Tesla employees. This company, OpenSea, announced massive layoffs, 20 percent of their employees. Uh, uh, in esports, our industry is dying. Layoff season is in full swing. Um, uh, job layoffs circulate throughout the tech industry. I mean, this is this is a, a, a real time, ongoing, you know, fifty car pileup that we're starting to, to see witness here. And so, my point is, is you know, the Fed official is is looking at you know the data that's probably from a month ago, saying, oh, you know, the job market, you know, there are a lot of people who had jobs, right? And, uh, he's not looking at all at where the puck is headed here. So exactly. Uh, no, ex exactly. I mean, if you did, it, you know, the, the one thing that though is kind of interesting to me is that nobody ever looks at the household survey. The household survey is where the employment report comes from. So they take the household survey and they call people up, they call up 60,000 households and they call up the same household for like six months. And they ask them the question, Adam, you working this month? Yeah, I'm working. Okay. Then call him up again next month. Adam, you're working. No, I got laid off. Okay. So, Tick mark there. Um, but then they take that and then they do all the seasonal adjustments and they do all this other massaging to the data to get the actual official BLS report. But nobody ever looks at this household survey. And if you keep a watch on the household survey, that thing's been terrible for the last four months. And in fact, the, this last employment report that came out showed this big increase in, in hiring on the on the BLS employment report, but the household survey showed big job losses. And the most important thing that came out of that household survey was a big decrease in full time and part time employment. Where was the increase in multiple job holders? Right. And I thought that was fascinating because that tells you what's really going on. And then, of course, you know, then they start doing, you know, we had birth death adjustment of, you know, 200,000 people created businesses. And we know that's that's completely wrong because small businesses are shutting down right now, not opening up. Um, and so that so there's all these problems with this employment report. And I think it's dangerous, again, for using this unemployment rate as a measure or a benchmark, A, because it's lagging, B, it's subject to massive revisions in 12 months and then in three years. Um, and we're making policy based on, you know, basically wild ass guesses and a lot of manipulation. So you know, if you take a look again, though, and we talked about this previously, we're just recovering jobs we gave away in 2020. We're not creating new jobs. You can't call this a strong job market because you're not creating new employment. You're just recovering employment that you laid off when you shut down the economy. A strong economy is where you are growing jobs above the population growth rate, which we are not even doing at all because, again, we're just getting back. If you take a look at the labor force, there's a big gap between the labor force of men and women relative to the long-term trend. Men are still trending well below 
the long-term trend in labor force participation. Labor force for women participation is even more dire than that. So there's, and then again, not even to talk about, there's a massive number of people that have just disappeared from the roles altogether. We just don't count them. Now, we're just assuming that these tens of millions of people that are sitting out there don't want a job, but I'm sure if you ask them and said, hey, would you like to have a job to earn some money? They would probably say, yeah, you know, because you see them on street corners with signs, right? So they're out there, um, but we just don't count them. So there's so many problems with the employment report. You know, it's, it's so dangerous to be pegging, you know, your monetary policy on this one employment report when the household survey tells you a very different picture about the economy. Right. And when it's a lagging indicator, right, yeah. it, it just seems like he doesn't look like he's looking for it at all. And, and, and who knows? I mean, he's works for the well, Fed. He gets a lot of information. I'm, I'm sure he gets, in, you know, I'm sure he well, sees some of this stuff. Yeah. Well, and don't forget, that you, I don't know if you remember this, but when Janet Yellen was the Federal Reserve chairman, she came, the, the Federal Reserve came out with a combination employment number. Remember this? They, they came out with this Fed version of their employment indicator. And they ran this thing for about three years while she was a Fed chairman. The problem with it was it never supported any of their claims. And this was all using real time <laughs> data. They were using jobless claims and, and you know, uh, parts of the household survey and a variety of other inputs. It was actually a really good indicator. But it, since it didn't agree with their policy, they shelved the thing. But it belied their narrative. It. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And, and, and that's sort of what I was trying to conclude with on this, which is that We've talked about this a little bit, but like, you know, these officials are the people that the average public person, the public says, well, it, it, you know, if, if, if the labor market's going to be bad, we're going to hear about it from the guys that track the labor market, right? You know, the Fed, just like, just like the Fed ever doesn't really want to say, hey, we're, we're going to have a recession, right? Because it doesn't want to spook people and it doesn't want to potentially be guilty of creating the recession psychologically, right? It's the same thing. It was the same thing with housing with Bernanke, right? Um, and I think now it's the same thing with jobs. They, they don't want to say, hey, we're going to, we're going to go into layoff season and a bunch of people is going to lose their jobs because they don't want to kind of, you know, both panic people, but also sort of put that blame on their shoulders that, yeah, we're the guys that are actually going to be responsible for you you're losing your job when you lose <laughs> right. it in a couple of months here. So the reason why I'm hammering on this is because uh, it obviously it's going to have a big impact on what happens economically. Um, consumer spending, as we've talked about, is 70 percent of GDP. If we go back into a standard style recession or worse, that's going to have job losses probably in the millions um, and uh, that's going to impact consumer spending. It also has a human cost. And a big part about this channel is just helping people prepare prudently for what may lie ahead. So we want to make sure that people are just waking up to the fact that if you work for an employer, if you get a paycheck for a living, you know, there's no there's no guarantee that that paycheck's always going to be coming. And so you should ask yourself now beforehand, what steps could I be taking today to lower my vulnerability if my employer gets in trouble, if layoffs come to my company, if I get laid off, et cetera. I've mentioned this a couple of times in the past. I'll do it again now. Uh, we have a free guide called the Layoff Survival Guide. It's over at wealthion.com slash layoffs. If you haven't read that yet, you should. It's got a lot of steps you can take today in advance of trouble coming down the road, but it also has a lot of steps that if you actually walk in and get a pink slip, it's, there's a lot of things that you should do like immediately. And this this gives you, you know, the laundry list of things that you should consider. Um, so I want to go from, from the job market, which is continuing to worsen, to the housing market, which is continuing to worsen. And just two quick stats here. Um, mortgage applications to purchase a home fell 4% for the week, um, which is a pretty big drop. And we're 18% lower than the same week a year ago, right? So we're seeing almost a 20% year over year decrease. Uh, and then applications to refinance a home loan. So these refis, which have been absolutely destroyed by mortgage rates doubling, um, they rose 2% for the week, but they are 80% lower <laughs> than what we saw a year ago. So we're I'm, and I'm, I'm surprised it's not more than that. I'm surprised it's not like 100%. It's lower. not like 100%. Yeah. You know, honestly, because I mean, it's, you have to think about it, right? Why would you refinance your house at a higher rate? But these are no, probably the, the people only, just trying to keep loan sharks off their back or something. Well, I was gonna say, I was gonna say the, 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 the probably and again, I don't have the stats in front of me and I'll have to go look them up. But I would, I would make two assumptions about refis right now is that one, it's people refining equity out of their house um, to go pay credit card debts or whatever it is. Right. I, I just started a commercial on, you know, it's, it's always interesting 
when you hear these commercials, but I just heard a commercial the other day uh, for a big mortgage company. They're like, you know, this may be the best time ever to refi that equity out of your house, you know, and it's like, do you realize what you're going to pay for that money, right? Yeah. But but even though, I mean, even really though, if, if I need equity, 5% loans, not bad. I mean, you know, we're used to two and a half what? or 3%, but 5% is not bad money. My first house was 10%. And I thought that was a hell of a deal. So right. well, and you, when yeah. you compare it to what credit card debt is, is yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it, I think so I think what's keeping some refis going is equity, equity, equity cash outs, as people start seeing their equity value starting to come down. They're like, man, I better lock that in if I'm going to take it. Um, uh, but the other side is, I'm just curious how much longer it's going to be before we just start seeing a real downturn in housing activity, period. It's starting to slow, but we haven't seen that. You know, you take a look kind of the run up in housing prices and take a look at 2008, it was a pretty sharp decline. And I'm just, you know, I'm not saying we've got another subprime crisis. I'm not saying anything like that. But housing and prices and activity is all what happens at the fringes, right? It's it's those people willing to buy or sell a house on any given day. You know, the people that live in their houses and are, you know, or renting their houses for a long period, they're not moving the market, right? They're not, they're not creating any supplier demand. So it's all what happens at the fringes. And so when that, fr what happens on the fringes stops, you get those pretty sharp declines in housing. You don't need to have a subprime crisis to have a pretty big downturn in housing prices. So I'm just curious how long it's going to be before we start to see that show up. And right. that's 42. And by the way, that's 42% of CPI. Right. Okay. So in other words, you're saying housing market cool, CPI can come down pretty fast. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so very true. And, and th there are a lot of shoes that can drop the, the housing market. It's slower to move. Um, it's not like the stock market, which, you know, is a lot more liquid. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's both what, what, um, you know, people are, are, are willing to pay and can pay, right. And with this inflation, you know, people are getting tapped out, right. Uh, it, it all is about to the cost of, of what it costs to get a mortgage. And as I just mentioned, that's basically doubled over the past year, which makes it harder. But then there's also the, you know, it should be a function of what local incomes can support, and if we end up going into a recession that has material layoffs, that's another shoe to drop here. And not trying to be histrionic here, but just we've been saying for a while, look, we're concerned about the scale of, of at which a housing correction could occur at, given the fact that prices got out of control in a bunch of markets and just the macroeconomic factors we're seeing here are not housing friendly. We've been talking about it sort of theoretically for a while. We're now beginning to see increasing evidence that, yep, this is going along. The data is now beginning to head along the trajectory that we, we, we thought it would. So we'll continue tracking this here. Yeah. Um, and Lance, you, for those that haven't watched uh, religiously, um, uh, like many of our viewers here, uh, you recently sold your house uh, to try to get it out ahead in advance of this wave. Well, hold on just a second. The closing is August the 3rd. We haven't closed yet. All right. So you don't want me to jinx it. Okay. Don't jinx it. Um, uh, but, but, you know, there's, that, there's also an important They, they, point, they but, haven't found the dead bodies yet? Right. Exactly. Okay. Good. But that, but it's a real important point though. Right. So, you know, we, we put our house up for sale in June. Right. But then we needed time to find a place to rent and which we've now located a place to rent. So, you know, we'll be moving at the end of the month and then closing is, is the 3rd of August. Now this is an important point because, you know, when we're looking at this, this housing data, right, we're, we're taking that as like, this is some real time data, right? So you take a look at the Schiller case index, right? That's three months old, when you look at that data, but any transaction that occurs, takes about three months for it to actually show up in the role. So in other words, what I'm saying is, is that housing could be falling a lot faster than we actually think it is right now, because by the time these transactions occur, fall through, whatever, it's two or three months before it gets reported back onto, you know, any type of price index. That's a great point. So the deal you struck, you know, with the handshake and the contract a couple mm -hmm. months back, it's not going to get reported until the close, which is still weeks from now. Right. right? And, and it may not even show up. My cell may not even show up. You know, we may close on the third, but by the time that that all goes through the system and gets processed and put on the rolls and all that, that may not show up for another three or four weeks. So it might be September the 1st before that, before my house 
shows up anywhere, right? Right. But but the boots on the ground housing action could have changed dramatically over the the, the months that it took right. from, from the handshake to, to the reporting. And I'm just exactly. curious, uh, do you have any sense for what the housing market's done in your area in that time? Has it softened further or stayed oh, the yeah. same? Oh, yeah. No, definitely. Um, there's, you know, it, it's, you know, there's been a lot of houses that are now on the market for a lot longer. Um, when we put our house up for sale, we were under contract within five days. Now there's houses sitting, you know, in our neighborhood. There's there's actually another house for sale that's the a very close model to my house that's at the other end of the street that has been on the market now for almost 40 days. Oh, interesting. interesting. And that's a classic, you know, early stage sign of a, yeah. of a cooling real estate market is as sellers don't want to reduce their prices yet, but the buyers don't show up at the list price. And so it just languishes on the, yeah. the market. Yeah, exactly. All right. Okay. So um, getting, getting to the wind up here, um, I don't really have a rant per se uh, for this week, but um, more an observation that I think uh, I'd love to hear your opinion on, which is I, I put out a tweet the other day just saying, gosh, you know, what's nuts is if a year ago, we had received uh, a letter from the future saying, hey, guys, CPI just came out this week, and it's 9.1%. I think most people would have rushed out a year ago with that advanced knowledge and bought gold. Okay, what's the, what's the classic inflation protection? I, I'm going to go get it. I'm going to get myself some gold. And, and, a, and a subset of the population that was into crypto would have said, this is exactly why I own crypto, and I'm going to go all in on Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Yet, if you look at the year-over-year -year return, gold's down six percent from a year ago, and Bitcoin's down like you know thirty-three percent or something like that. Of course, they're they, they both got up a lot higher by the end of the year, so you know they, they've fallen more since the start of the year. But yeah. but but still, the point is is what seemed obvious to everybody, the obvious choice, didn't behave the way that people obviously thought that it would. Yeah. And I'm curious if we're gonna. If we're going to see more of that as, as this current macroeconomic situation plays out here, you know, um, I'm just trying to ask myself, like, what are the what are the things that seem obvious to people? So a big one, obviously, is is Fed pivot. Yeah. Fed is going to at some point, things are going to be so painful, the Fed's going to pivot. Uh, and then people have a set of assumptions in their head of what that's going to look like. But very well may not play out that way because it tends to usually not to, you know, like you <laughs> said, as a contrarian, you don't like it when too many people are on your side of the yeah. boat. It makes you feel like your assumption is maybe wrong because too many people share it. So yeah. I'm just curious, you know, it, it, it's do you funny. share the sense that that people are maybe setting themselves up for an obvious disappointment here? Yeah, you know, it is very interesting. And, and you know, yeah, we're going to get a lot of hate mail now because now you've deigned on gold and Bitcoin and I, I got the Italian. So, um, you know, look. And I'm a gold holder. So I, I, look, we own we own a smidge of gold in our portfolio, too. And in fact, we just you know, we haven't talked about our trades, but we sold half our gold position yesterday. Um, and, and, and you know, it's just funny because this was the conversation I had with Mike uh, Leibowitz on Thursday. And, you know, I was like, it's, it's been very interesting because all of the trades that you would have normally banked on for an inflationary environment have not worked. You know, um, you know, again, you know, people that have been buying gold because of inflation, it hasn't worked. It's been a terrible uh, hedge for inflation. We're going to look back at this period, just like we, we've we looked back previously, you know, from in other inflationary periods, and gold has not been a good inflation hedge um, ever since it really became delinked from the dollar. I think that was the big differential is that when we went off the gold, gold standard, it stopped being a good inflation hedge. Um, you know, it's more of a fear trade than anything else. And what gold actually plays off to better than anything else is real yields. So inflation adjusted yields. And when we start to see the real yield dynamic change, I think we'll start to see gold perform better. So we still like gold right now, but, you know, going, it's, it's more of a, a disinflationary uh, economic concern, market fear, transaction base, right? So it's this, you know, if if what we believe is coming in terms of, you know, an economic recession, stock market's got to go down some more, we actually get some real fear into the market, I think gold's going to play well. I don't think Bitcoin's going to play well. Um, you know, Bitcoin has been very tied in terms of its movements to the NASDAQ. It's been a risk asset. And you know, as a function, 
that, you know, for instance, with Bitcoin and Ethereum, and particularly a lot of these other off market coins that were just kind of all sprung up because of just the, the FOMO of the whole Bitcoin movement. Um, you know, I think there's a real risk that if we get into an environment where we get weaker stock prices, weaker economic growth, more pressure on uh, consumption and this real kind of pressure on attitude about investing, which has been really one of the big pressures on Bitcoin as of late, you know, I, I don't think that's going to play as well. I think gold will be the better play. You know, again, just assumptions here based on past history of looking at how different assets perform in different environments that there's this, you know, risk on risk off relative to the market with Bitcoin. But when we get into a real fear trade, I think gold is going to play better than, than Bitcoin in that environment. I could be wrong. Um, but, you know, just looking at how things are playing out right now, I don't think I am. Okay. And, and uh, great to hear your thoughts on those. I, I wasn't digging around so much for what do you think is going to happen with gold and Bitcoin, but it's good to know what you think. It was more sort of like, are, are there any big assumptions you think that the investing herd is making right now that if they if they if they're lucky enough to get it they may find themselves disappointed because what they assumed was going to be the obvious repercussions didn't actually materialize but before i let you answer on that i'll get crucified by this crowd if i have another week where i forget to ask you about your trades so yeah. you mentioned real briefly selling some gold but but can you tell us what you guys have done in the past week um in, in the past week, we didn't do a whole lot. We um, we sold. We had uh, two index trading positions: one in the Nasdaq and one in the equal weight S and P five hundred. Um, we sold the 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 Nasdaq one at a slight profit. We took a slight loss on the RSP um, just because of you know energy is not the the equal weighted index um, has less technology and more energy in it, and and energy was very oversold and is due for a bounce, but this whole market environment's really kind of iffy here. So we, we went ahead and pulled the RSP trade off, just raised some more cash this week, and we'll kind of revisit that trade you know, here in the near future. And again, we sold half our gold position, we broke support there. And, and again, you know, we like gold longer term, and we'll come back and we'll add back to our gold position at some point, but we just needed to take some of the pressure off of the portfolio for right now, we're 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 running ahead. We're up about seven eight hundred basis uh, seven eight hundred points. Well, I'll spit that out. Hmm. We're about seven to eight hundred points over our benchmark right now. So we're just trying to maintain that lead um, until we get into a better market environment position where we have a better outlook. You know, right now the problem with the market is is just kind of jumping all over the place, and we're not getting really good signals. A lot of our technical signals are 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 working, but they're not working great. We're not getting good firm signals with a lot of follow through and good volume and, and commitment. So it's been a really tough trading environment over the last couple of weeks. So we're just going to step back, relax a little bit, uh, kind of let the markets tell us what it wants to do next. And then we'll revisit, you know, some trading positions. Good, good. All right. And, and that caution, I just want to, in real time, congratulate you for, because that's a big reason why we at Wealthy on, you know, we're so excited to partner with your firm, which is, that's what we think a good advisor does is when the good advisor doesn't feel like the potential return is worth the potential risk. You know, you want that discipline to say, you know what, I'm just not going to chase that stuff right now. I'm going to wait until I have opportunities that seem like sure plays. So yeah. good for doing that. Um, all right. Well, so back to my question, it's okay if you don't have any, any things that immediately comes to mind, but I'm just curious. And, and again, I mentioned sort of the Fed pivot. But um, are there anything out there that you think that, the, that, that folks may actually, what they expect to happen may happen in terms of the event, but it may not actually have the, the outcome that they're all planning on? Yeah, well, first of all, whenever time you say Fed pivot, the, immediately my head flashes to that Friends clip where they're trying to move the couch up the staircase. So. <laughs> pivot, pivot, <laughs> pivot. Um, but look, there's there's a couple of things I think that investors are going to wake up a little bit surprised to, and and we're already starting to see it. You know, we talked about uh, about three, four, five weeks ago now. I can't remember about people should really consider taking profits out of energy and commodities and those type of things because. That was, you know, a, a trade that got well ahead of itself, and there was going to be a big correction in that. There's still, I'm still getting a lot of emails from people, you know, wanting to be super long energy, and and they're like, this is, you know, just a rest stop on the way to higher prices. Uh, I'm not so sure about that. I think there's, you know, when we get into a recessionary, disinflationary, deflationary trade, not only domestically but globally, a lot of those areas have a lot more room to go down still. 
Um, so there is risk there. So I think that's, you know, I think one of the, the, you know, the trades that may surprise people is just how volatile commodities can be. And, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of people throwing out charts is like, well, you know, the commodity to stock ratio is really right. low and it's time for this to happen. And that's not the way it really works. I, we can make all types of correlations to things and correlation doesn't always mean it's, it's really there. Right. And, things, and sorry to interrupt, but that ratio can get a lot better too, just by stocks coming down a lot more. Right. That's correct. <laughs> it doesn't mean and that was, commodities have to go up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of risk there. I, you know, I think, you know, still that, you know, there's a lot of people and, and look, even before we got into this, uh, you know, this whole kind of market dynamic that we're in now, I've had people for the last several years that have been emailing me. It's like, I'm a hundred percent and gold bullion at my house. And I'm like, that's really not a great idea. Um, and, you know, there's still this, again, I think one of the big, you know, the big things I'm seeing is a lot of people going, the dollar's going to zero. I just want to be in gold because that's fine to be in gold, but you can't spend gold unless you convert it to dollars. This is the problem with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's great, but if you want to spend it, you got to convert it into something you can actually spend. So, you know, it's great to be in gold, but if you've got to convert it into a dollar that went to zero, and this is why the dollar can't ever go to zero, by the way, <laughs> but, you know, the, you know, there's so many flawed theories about, you know, currencies and, and, and what happens with gold and all these type of things. You have to work, you know, your, your investment philosophy has to work within the realm of how the world actually works. So there, there's a lot of great theories about stuff. And yeah, I can make a theory that gold is going to go to $5,000 an ounce. And I can have a theory about the dollar going to zero and nobody ever wanting the dollar again. But somebody's got to have to have something that somebody else wants. And, and right now we don't have that. So we have to, our theories have to at least align somewhat with reality. Yeah, so I totally agree. And that's why I brought up this whole topic here. Um, and I'm going to try to end relatively quickly because I see we're going near our usual, yeah. you know, hour and a half limit here. Um, but like, so uh, I, I'm, I put out a video last week on I bonds. I'm just finishing up a video now on tips and helping people understand the two. And like tips are a great example where, you know, they're, they're a bond like instrument. And so uh, they have a principal, they have a coupon and the bond uh, adjusts with the CPI. So um, if CPI goes up, your principal gets adjusted upwards, right? And so people will say, oh, well, if I think inflation's coming, I should own a tip because if inflation goes up, my tip's going to going to appreciate, right? And, 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 and yes, um, but like a bond, what's happening with interest rates out in the general market also matters. And if interest rates rise faster than the CPI does, your tip actually can lose market value in the open market, the secondary market for tips, yeah. even though you're right. The exactly. CPI went up and my tip, right? And so my point is here is you, 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 you really can't have a, a, a one trick pony thesis where if happen, this happens, then this is definitely gonna happen. You have to really, to your point, look at the world in which we live and understand that these things are multifactorial, which for one reason is why you should never put all your eggs in one basket, right? Because you can never know everything. So diversification is gonna help you in general. But you also have to be very cautious about falling in love with a thesis that's a, if A happens, then B must happen after that, right? Um, I see you nodding as I'm saying this. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, and there's a there's a little parable I think I've got time to share here that that really has always stuck with me. Um, this is sort of like the law of unintended consequences, which is a lot of what we're talking about here. Um, back in colonial India, uh, the British general or whoever was in charge of I think it was Bombay back when it was named Bombay. Um, he was walking down the street and there were cobras. He saw a cobra in the street. And he said, hey, we, we can't have venomous snakes running in the streets here while we're in charge here. So what he did is he passed a, a law that basically said, or, or, or a bounty, he said, hey, look, um, I will, will pay you a certain amount of money for every you know, cobra head you bring us, right? Um, and he found he started getting swamped with cobra heads because people were taking him up on his offer. But they, every week he kept getting more and more cobra heads until he realized what was going on. He was like, wait a minute, there shouldn't be this many snakes around. You realize people were starting to breed cobras. He had created a market for venomous snakes, right? Exactly. So, so, then what he, so of course that wasn't what he intended. So he tells everybody, all right, forget it. The bounty's over, right? So what happened? 
everybody was breeding cobras, just let him go. So the cobra <laughs> problem in the streets actually got worse as a result of his initial yeah. program, right? And, and the point here with this is, I just think that that's very indicative of, of, of many people who have a sort of a simplistic approach here, like we're talking about, A happens, then B must happen. Um, you got to be open to, hey, there's, there's you know, many factors that go into this. And yeah, B might happen first, but then C might happen and D might happen and E might happen. And you've got to be open-minded here. Yeah, exactly. The Cobra effect, we, we wrote an article about that a while back. Um, you know, that happens a lot in the markets and that's all these unintended consequences. In fact, we talked about the Cobra effect specifically in relation to all the stimulus that was put into the markets. Right. And, 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 you know, that was a good example of what happens when you do that. And, and you know, now I just wrote one last week called the Bullwhip effect, talking about the, the consequence of all this liquidity now running down supply chain pipelines and creating this Bullwhip effect. So, you know, there's, there's all these effects that occur, these, uh, but these are all these unintended consequences. And that's the thing, as we were just talking about, on your investment policy and investment thesis, whatever you think is the case, and this is, and to your point, we, and we need to have this conversation also maybe next week, is the difference between diversification of assets and diversification of advisors. I get a bunch of people calling, I was like, I'm diversifying my advisors. I'm going to have 12 different advisors to manage my money. That's a terrible idea. Um, diversifying your assets is an excellent idea. Those are two very different things. But, you know, when you're talking about making a bet, and this is why we talked about previously, one-sided bets are a terrible way to run your portfolio. You should always have your bet. If you want to have a bet on higher energy prices, that's great. Then also have a bet in your portfolio just in case you're wrong. And that's why you run a risk-managed portfolio. That way, if something goes wrong, you've got something that'll benefit from you being wrong on your thesis. All right, great. All right, well, we'll have to wrap it up there. We'll earmark that diversification of advisors for next time, Lance. Uh, just to end on a couple of quick positive notes. First off, uh, we continue to get a tremendous amount of interest from folks in the retirement webinar that we're going to be putting on, as you said, probably early August, but we got to lock that time in so we can let people know. I think I'm up to like 700 names now. And folks, if you haven't emailed me yet, but you want to get put on the list of folks to be alerted when we have open registration for that free webinar, just email uh, retirement at wealthion.com. We'll put you on the list. Um, and in closing here, Lance, just on something positive, um, I know you're, uh, we, we've talked a bit about in this program uh, about we're sort of into health and fitness and whatnot. I had a game changing experience um, where I've had bad shoulders since high school. I screwed them up in football, they dislocated. I had surgery, surgery on one of them that dislocated a few months after the surgery. I mean, just they've been miserable. And so I've had just sort of chronic pain and issues with my shoulders for 30 plus years. Um, and I uh, had heard about this, but, but finally decided to do it where there's a uh, kind of a goal of just trying to hang for mm -hmm. up to seven minutes a day, not all at once, but you break it up as much as you can tolerate hanging. Um, and it's, it's, it's basically based on the fact that humans are descended from primates. We, we are supposed to hang in many ways, but we just yeah. don't at all in our modern lifestyle. And it ends up creating, um, basically we have these, these, our shoulder joints don't open as much as they naturally would if we were using them to climb. And, uh, all, all I'm going to say is by day two, I probably had like an 80% reduction in just the chronic pain that I feel. And um, I've been doing it now religiously for about a, a week and a half, only a week and a half in. And it has just been a game changer in terms of how my shoulders, both the mobility, but just how they sit and feel during the day. So I could, I, I could rave about this for another hour. I won't. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I tweeted out a little bit and, and I've heard a ton of feedback from folks who discovered the same thing along at different yep. points of their lives and how much it changed for them. So I just wanted to share it here in case any of our listeners are chronic shoulder um, sufferers like I was and want to try this. No, I, <clears throat> I think it's great. And, and, you know, you should. I mean, you know, one thing that, that people have trouble with doing pull-ups, right? Hanging is the best way. If you want to learn how to do a pull-up, start by hanging. And, you know, it's a great way to start building that strength in shoulders, but it also opens up the, the flexibility of the shoulders. You know, one of the things that you always see with old people is they shuffle and that's because they don't stretch. So just incorporating, you know, yoga, um, Pilates, anything into your exercise program where you get some stretching will do you a lifetime of favors. Absolutely. And the last thing on this hanging thing is it's like a natural form of traction. So if you have back issues as well, it's elongating your spine, it's getting blood in there, 
Uh, it's helping things heal and firm up. So um, again, can't rave enough about it. All right. Well, folks, uh, thanks so much for making the end of this yet another long uh, Saturday podcast here. Um, whatever happens next in the market, Lance and I will be tracking it here on this program next week. Uh, obviously, as you've heard me say many times, everything we just talked about in this program really underscores the wisdom of working with a financial advisor who understands all these macro issues and can help you create a strategy and a plan uh, to invest for this type of market environment. Um, if you've got a good one, great, stick with them. If you don't or would like uh, a second opinion uh, from one like Lance, maybe even Lance's firm specifically, just go to Wealthion.com, fill out the short form there, and we'll connect you with one of our endorsed advisors to have a free, no commitment, uh, no strings attached consultation. They'll just sit down, learn your personal financial situation, tell you what they think you should do. You can take that, implement it all yourself. You can give it to your own financial advisor, or if you like these guys, you can talk with them about maybe working with them in the future. Um, all right, Lance, welcome back from Italy. Glad you had such a great time there. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. <music>